Hey, wow, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good afternoon. Today I want to take you on a journey to the outer reaches of the solar system, beyond Mars. We're going to talk about two major missions. This is Dawn. It's going to Ceres. In fact, it's at Ceres now. And New Horizons, which is flying by Pluto. What's critical about these two very important small planets is it the first time we've really got to look at them up close and personal? Small planets are important to understand in the origin and evolution of our solar system. One of our um, major scientific planetary science modelers said to me one day, you know, it's like a crime scene. The blood spatters, those small details, that sometimes solves the mystery. And indeed, today, I want to give you a little flavor for what's happening in our field and the excitement that these two missions are causing because they will revolutionize our understanding of how we got here. So when we look at our solar system four and a half billion years ago, a large cloud was beginning to collapse. Some perturbation, we believe, did it. That, that collapsing, as the angular momentum is conserved, creates a disk. And in that disk and in that cloud, which was dust, the dust then accumulates, becomes larger bodies, and it accretes. And accretion actually is a violent process. It's, a, it's made up of collisions and then reforming. And constant collisions, constant reforming, and, and the objects that start out are completely pulverized and create new objects. So here's a little simulation of how it goes. Turbulence in these clouds, producing little clumps of material. And the clumps of material then are the start of our planets. Uh, we also see that they get to be certain sizes. Right now, we can model the accretion process up to about a kilometer in size. But to get any bigger, we don't know really what happens. Now, we call that kilometer in size a planetesimal. I mean, that's the basic building block of a planet. So the question is, do we have them in our solar system? And the answer is, yeah, they're all over the place. They're strewn about in the asteroid belt. But in the end, what we've made in our solar system through these processes is a series of terrestrial planets and a series of gas giants. Uh, that's what I learned when I was in grade school. But in reality, there's a third group of bodies in the solar system. And that's brand new, and we'll talk about that. What you see here are the terrestrial planets, that's that first group. Mercury, Venus, Earth plus the Moon, and Mars. And in the outer part of our solar system, indeed, we have our gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn. And they have a certain composition, mostly hydrogen and helium. But the other two gas giants are actually what we call ice giants. These can't contain a lot of water and ammonia, different types of ices. And we're not really sure how they got that. In between our terrestrial planets and our gas and ice giants is a group of bodies called the asteroid belt. And here they are. Uh, these are uh, approximately 300,000. There's probably many, many more. And they can be very small. They can be on the order of a few hundred meters. They can be dust material. And they can be very large, up to 500 kilometers, or even 900 kilometers. And the two that we, got, we went to most recently are Vesta and, and now Ceres with the Dawn mission. Here's a selection of um, the asteroids uh, that are coming out of the asteroid belt. Some are even in the asteroid belt. And um, uh, Emily Lakawana put this together in a very nice montage. As you can see, there are various sizes, kilometer, 10 kilometer, 
Uh, in fact, uh, Itakawa, which is a beautiful little rubble pile, is just a dot on this figure. It's only about 140 meters in, in length. And the largest one uh, uh, before dawn, the European Space Agency Rosetta mission flew by. It's called Letitia. And it's uh, oblong, uh, but it's about 100 kilometers or so in size. Well, what's that third group I was talking about? That third group we started to observe in the 1990s. Our telescopes were getting good enough to spot them. And the revolution of understanding what these bodies were started from ground-based astronomy. And this group of bodies are largely icy bodies. Although there, there are, uh, there's plenty of rocky material out there that, it, that these ices have accumulated around. Here's the first one of that set. Right here, it's Pluto. Here's all the inner planets. And then we have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And now I'm gonna go through a little movie and each frame of it will be one year of observations that we will fill in. Now this group of bodies was proposed by Gerald Kuiper in the 1950s. It's, he believed, debris left over from the formation of our solar system, it's out there. It's out beyond Pluto. And that was just a theory. But in 1990, we indeed started to observe it. We believe there are tens of thousands of these objects beyond the orbit of Pluto. As you can see, the plane of the planets, the ecliptic, and compare that to the distribution of these bodies. Like the collapsing cloud that formed our planets and created them all in a plane we call the ecliptic, this region hasn't reached that stage yet. Our solar system is still in the process of evolving. Here's what they are. We call them Kuiper Belt objects. And as you can see, they're really beautiful in color, and they're varied in color. These probably have ammonia ices and in addition to water ices on their surfaces. As you can see, many of them are comparable to the asteroid belt in size. Uh, these are the two, uh, uh, two of the largest asteroids, not the largest, Ceres and Pallas. Uh, Vesta is the second largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. Uh, and we just don't have much information about many of these, which were very far out. Perhaps as far out as 50 astronomical units, where, where Neptune is on the order of, um, of 40. Here's a comparison of sizes. Here's Letitia right here that huge asteroid, irregular-shaped, cratered body that uh, Rosetta flew by, and then Vesta, Ceres, Pluto, uh, with respect to our moon, and of course a couple sizes of states. So what do the modelers say about this? Now that we know much more about the structure of our solar system, having three zones, terrestrial, gas giants, and then the Kuiper Belt objects, how can we form this set of bodies over four and a half billion years? So the modeler started out assuming that the planets are in the location they are today at the beginning when the cloud collapsed. Ah, that's what I was taught in grade school. And what they find is they cannot form this system. Even after four and a half billion years, they can't get these planets together, particularly the outer ones, Uranus and Neptune. They cannot form them. So right around 2000, some of the scientists thought, 
well, we're going to have to change the conditions. How about if we formed them closer together? And let's see if that happens. And the reason why is very simple. It's a basic principle. Objects closer to the sun can grow faster. So if we assume all the, all the giant planets were formed in, inside of 15 astronomical units, where, of course, an astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the sun, and then all the icy bodies from there on, let's see if we can get this configuration together. And it turns out they could, but they ran the simulation for a very long period of time, a billion years. And, and something fantastic happened. And I'm going to show you that simulation. Here it is. Here is the uh, uh, orbits of those planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all below 20, you know, on the order of 15 astronomical units. And then, of course, the debris field, that Kuiper Belt set of objects all around that. So the model starts, the planets form, everything looks great, but then right around 850 million years, something absolutely spectacular happens. And in fact, you can see it starting. These bodies are interacting with each other. They're pushing their orbits, particular Jupiter is the bad guy in this one. And at 850, the whole system becomes chaotic. What happens? Jupiter pushes those planets out, attracts the Kuiper belt, and it brings the Kuiper belt in. And as it brings the Kuiper belt in, along with the asteroids, it bombards the inner part of our solar system. This now fit very well with what the Apollo astronauts had found out. They brought back rocks from the moon. We dated those rocks. The rocks dated from the origin of the Earth-Moon system at four and a half billion years. But then there are some newer rocks, about 800 million years newer than that. At about 3.8 billion years, new rocks were formed on the moon. They didn't know what to do. They called that a bombardment. Something bombarded the inner part of the solar system. And now we know, perhaps, what that is. It's the rearrangement of our solar system to what it is today, starting from a completely different initial condition. Think of that. Huge planets were moved. Massive planets. And so here's what we now believe happened. So 4.2 4 billion years ago, they actually had formed up quite nicely in these positions, and the debris field was left over. They swept up everything that was going on. We see these smaller rocky bodies. They're trying to form something. They're actually trying to form a planet. Jupiter's attraction is so great between Mars and Jupiter, it's keeping these bodies apart. And that's really an important clue for us to go to that asteroid belt and look for important clues of this early period. And then we see at the late heavy bombardment at about 3.8 billion years, Jupiter moved inward a little bit, but in the meantime, it pushed Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune outward, and the Kuiper belt came in. And of course, now we see uh, Pluto as part of that Kuiper belt. We see debris all over in this area. And of course, now we see these two objects, the largest objects in the asteroid belt, Ceres and Vesta. But what are they? What are they? Are they protoplanets? Are they the building blocks of larger planets? Right now we call them Dwarf planets. Or maybe they're even Kuiper belt objects that moved inward during this mixing up of the solar system. And that's what the spacecraft Dawn is all about. Dawn is going to, has gone to Vesta. Here, as you can see, it uh, came in, got into orbit around Vesta, spent about a year there, and studied that body extensively. 
It used some of our new technologies, which are ion engines. You take a gas and you ionize it. You have a, a charged grid, and you push these ions through that grid and shove them out the back. And for every reaction, there's an equal opposite reaction. It pushes the spacecraft forward. The more material you throw out, the faster you move forward. These ion engines are fantastic. For Dawn, it didn't take too long to get out to the asteroid belt, but it used its ion engines to constantly change its orbit. And as it continually changed its orbit, it actually ended up at the orbit around the sun that is most Vesta-like. It created nearly a circular orbit as Vesta does. And so as it saddled up to Vesta, it was moving at about 60, 70 miles per hour. Very gentle. We're used to flybys at seven kilometers per second. And this spacecraft saddled up to Vesta at 60 miles an hour. Gravity from that body grabbed the spacecraft and brought it into orbit. And that's what happened here. And as it observed it over the year, what we see in this beautiful body is color rendition. This is, uh, gives us an idea of the mineralogy of the body. It's heavily cratered. In fact, there are some really impact ridges that really almost shook this whole body apart, we believe. You can see this is a beautiful impact of material that's, uh, that stays pretty, pretty much in that area. Another enormous impact occurred in the southern hemisphere, leaving this uh, central peak. You know, when you look at the moon and other craters, you see that central peak. That only happens with impacts of certain size. It's a rebound in the material upward. And indeed, uh, Vesta has this enormous peak uh, in the southern hemisphere from an impact that occurred and blew the bottom part of, the, of this body away. So what did we learn from Dawn at Vesta? Well, we actually learned that from the mineralogy, we have pieces of Vesta here on the Earth. We call these the HED meteorites. So indeed, that impact, and we believe it occurred in that southern hemisphere, that cataclysmic impact that blew the bottom out of Vesta, ended up all the way to the inner part of the solar system, came through our atmosphere, and fell on, on the Antarctic ice sheet. And then every summer, we have a team of people that go down there in snowmobiles. They come up in a line, and they drive across this white, blinding white snow sheet and see these black objects. And those are meteorites. Of course, meteorites fall everywhere. In the ocean, here in New York, in Russia, everywhere. It's recognizing them. It's knowing what they are, being able to pick those rocks up and understanding those are meteorites. In the, in the uh, icy regions, like the Antarctic, they pop out. And they're so easy to observe. We collect anywhere from 600 to 900 a year, a season. Now, we don't have that many from Vesta, but it's a particular type. And the mineralogy of those objects indeed matches the mineralogy of the body we call Vesta out in the uh, asteroid belt. Uh, Vesta is differentiated. Wow. What does that mean? Well, as these bodies continually accrete, hammer into each other, and then reform, they also, in an early part of the solar system, have radioactive material. That keeps them hot. When they get to be so big that the heat from all the layers of material above it melts the interior, then the heavier materials will sink to the bottom. And we call that process differentiation. We now know Vesta has an iron core. It's huge. The iron core is about 220 kilometers in diameter. This is a little less than half the size of this body, which is about 500 kilometers in diameter. Another thing, indeed, this body is a protoplanet. So we now, for the first time, have seen what we believe must happen from the accumulation of dust into these 
planetesimals, and then more planetesimals coming together to create protoplanets. Proto so this is a size for which protoplanets start. So on to Ceres. With our ion engines, Dawn turned those on and gradually moved away from Vesta, orbiting at higher and higher altitudes until it escaped its gravity, and off it goes to the large, but we call small, planet Ceres, the largest body in the asteroid belt. And here's its orbit relative to Mars and Jupiter. You can see it's an elliptical orbit. And in fact, here's the uh, plane of the planets, the ecliptic. And you can see Vesta is at an incline. So the asteroid belt is still in that process, as I mentioned, of trying to form a planet. It didn't do that. And so we want to know what Ceres is all about. We want to go back to the early part of the solar system to look at this object that hasn't changed much since then. Dawn is not an acronym. Dawn is about going to the beginning of our solar system. Along the way, a couple years ago, the Herschel Infrared Space Telescope was looking at Dawn and saw these emission lines. They're water vapor lines. That was really startling, very exciting. And it turns out it looks like there's preferred longitudes for that body to emit water. So as it sits and spins on its axis, and everything in the solar system spins at some rate or another, even the sun spins, we notice that these lines, uh, these water vapor lines occur at specific longitudes, two longitudes as a matter of fact. And what are they? Are they cryovolcanoes? Is this body active? Where does the heat come from? How could it possibly emit water in geysers? We're seeing that on other bodies, but those bodies are, are in systems of large planets like Enceladus, for which tidal forces are working to squish those bodies back and forth and create the heat necessary for plumes to occur. So how could it possibly be that way on Ceres? Here's our best wrong model of Ceres. I say that because in a matter of a year, it'll be completely different. And we believe it has a rocky core, and then an ice layer, and then a thin crust, and the crust is probably sprinkled asteroidal material, all the way from rocks that it's accreted uh, to, uh, to dust, uh, etc. all of its surface, and that's why when we look at it and we look at its spectrum, it looks much more like an asteroid than an icy body. But if it's really an icy body, it may actually, it may actually, as we go through this crust and go down, and, and, and heat increases as you get towards the center of large bodies, get to the point where the ice melts and there may be water there. That's a possibility. We'll soon find out. Dawn now is captured in orbit around Ceres. This is really a spectacular event. It happened in March. Here's what it did as it approached in this manner. It flew by Ceres, and it's thrusting using its ion engines, and then was captured in orbit on March 6th. So let me show you the orbit. There it is. At that instant, this would have been the orbit for dawn around Ceres, but it kept up with the ion engines. And those ion engines then continually reshaped that red orbit over and over and over again. And we're just days away from coming into a new circular orbit, uh, what we call, uh, uh, when we get to this orbit, we're going to look at the body very extensively and watch it go over three, three or more rotations, and we call this rotation characteristic number three. I'm going to show you the first two, by the way. And that will occur April 23rd, coming up. So here's how it did it. You can see the ion engines working away, blasting on. And so how, how much of a push is that? If you have a sheet of paper and you put it on your hand, the weight of that paper is the, is the thrust this system produces. It's hardly anything but it's always going, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And as you can see, it's reshaped its orbit. It actually fired uh, 
uh, in retro right in here and to slow down to get into orbit. So here's the schedule of events. This is what we've been working on. We've gone through all these. I'm going to show images from the ones that are starred. And uh, just a few days ago, we got uh, some really intense um, uh, imaging done, uh, 14 times Hubble resolution at uh, 22,000 kilometers. That's going to be released to the public tomorrow. Uh, they're in the process this weekend of getting it together. And so I'm assured it's going out tomorrow. And then, of course, in just a matter of days, we're going to end up uh, uh, really sitting in that larger orbit, 13,000 kilometers, at 20 times Hubble resolution, and, and look at the body. So along the way, uh, here's, uh, here's our first peek at, at uh, Ceres. Now, this is only a few pixels. It's not very big. It was done in December at 1.2 million uh, miles away. This was incredibly important to do. These are called operational navigation images. Okay, So no matter how good our telescopes are, we don't really know where that body is exactly. And the further away it is, the larger the air might be. And so since we're getting right up close to it, and we're going to orbit it, we have to know exactly where it's at. And so we stop, turn off the ion engines, in fact, the cameras are on the same side of the ion engine, so when the ion engines are on, the cameras aren't on. So we have to flip the spacecraft over and then take some images, and those are op-nav, so that allows us to say, ah, okay, here's the edges of the body, and compare that with our navigation solutions, and flip back over and then turn the ion engines back on. In January, uh, we took another op-nav op image. This is right at about Hubble resolution. Okay? Now what's really fantastic about comparing these images is Hubble took this more than 10 years ago. And you can see a nice white spot. You can see some darker regions. And you see those same features. All right? So this body's been pretty much the same qualitatively over the last 10 years or so because we can compare it with Hubble data. So here's our, what we call our rotation characteristic one. We stopped thrusting, turned around. This was several times Hubble resolution and began to image the body and then put it into a little mosaic. Now what's really great about this is that we saw these bright spots. There's a couple bright spots. Here's another set of bright spots. In fact, uh, there are five or more bright spots uh, on this body. That's really tantalizing. So when we get into orbit, and we're going to really take a look at these, we're going to determine uh, what, why their composition and why their reflectivity is so much different than the rest of the body. So um, here we are on February 19th. Here's another rotational characteristic. Uh, more bright spots. Uh, and the really bright one, that one, we resolved into two. Now, we couldn't resolve them individually any further than that, but that one bright spot that Hubble saw, that Don originally saw, that we compared against uh, over that 10-year period, is actually two really big, very big and bright spots. And they're sitting in the middle of a crater. Well, one is. The other one is off to one side. So that's really spectacular. So in the analysis, what do we see? What do we see? Well, we see in the northern hemisphere, Crater terrain, a lot of craters. And of course, that means its age is old. The areas that have more craters means the body is older in that, in that location. However, we also see in the lower part of this one image only a few craters and an outline of what looks like what we would call a basin. Another huge impact which gouged out this body but then material flowed in and solidified, for which then only a few craters occurred since then. We don't know the date of this, but that's the idea behind crater counting and over certain regions is to get ages, and we will. So we'll be mapping the ages of various locations on this body. And of course, the bright spot, we now know, 
they're still unknown. <laughs> Here is the latest OpNav, uh, the one we just did on the 15th. As I said, they're rushing hard to get it together into a movie uh, series of frames. Uh, that will come out tomorrow. Now this one is, uh, we're just now starting um, uh, to get so close that we're um, near that uh, near that 13,000 kilometer uh, region. This is, I think, at 22 or so, no, 33 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers. And so, uh, but it's from the Northern Hemisphere. So it'd be really great if we could have seen where the white spots are, but they're just over the horizon. I have been assured that the sequence of images that they just took are now at an altitude and at a location where they actually can see further down in latitude, which would include the white spots, the really bright white spots. So I'm hanging on the edge of my seat, just like you are, till tomorrow. <laughs> now, if we look at the Herschel data and compare that with dawn data up close, here's what we find. So here's the dawn data spread out in a Mercator projection. Here are the two regions where water vapor was observed being emitted. These are the active longitudes. And it turns out this is the region of these two bright spots. Uh, this is the region with the uh, uh, two bright spots in the equator, okay, together. But what's really fascinating is, as you can see from the colors here, the mineralogy is very different across this body. And you can see the white spots have indeed affected this whole region. So, uh, so the mineralogy of, on the surface of this, of this region of the one, one larger white spot in the, in the northern hemisphere is all over the place, whereas these white spots are only affecting the local area. The mineralogy is, is still pretty much the same throughout a large region. Okay, that's the best scientific interpretation I can give you and it's pretty crappy. <laughs> but that's the start of science. You know, that's the hint of discovery. That's what we're going for. So in a matter of days, on the 23rd of April, we're going to get into orbit, circular orbit, beautiful circular orbit, and we're going to watch uh, Ceres um, rotate on its axis several times. And we're going to be able to see uh, all sorts of views of it. As you can see here, we'll get some really great up-close images. We're also going to get, from the, the night side, some limb profiles. Limb profiles would be great, particularly if there are cryovolcanoes or something that is spraying above the limb. We'll be able to spot it. You know, when we see the plumes on Enceladus at Saturn, the only way we can see that is if we step back and we get a limb shot, and we see, we see the, uh, the icy plumes coming from the southern hemisphere on Enceladus. So we'll have a great opportunity to look for those plumes if they are there. Uh, Ceres um, is in for uh, quite a reveal. We're going to get to lower and lower altitude over time. Spacecraft will be there for the rest of its life. It won't have the ability to leave. It will use up all its fuel but it'll go through three major circular orbits. We call the first one the survey orbit. Uh, this is um, uh, far closer than the one I just mentioned. Uh, this goes now to about uh, 4,500 4, kilometers, and, and, it, and it's going to give us a great view all over the place, put things in context. Then we're going to have a high altitude orbit. We'll go down to 1,400 or so kilometers. And then we'll have a low altitude orbit, uh, just uh, right off the deck, so to speak. And we'll get some really close views of this. And we've been flying right over all the white spots. And I won't be calling them white spots anymore when we do that. We'll know what the heck they are. So what do we expect to find out? Well, is Ceres an active body? Why did Herschel see it when it did? And if it's not active now, we know it was active in the past. When will it be active again? Don will be at, at Ceres for about 16 months until it runs out of fuel. And it will be in an orbit uh, that will be stable, so Ceres won't be able to pull it down. Uh, but it will, of course, uh, freeze and be the end of the mission. 
a series of protoplanet whose development was retarded by Jupiter's gravity. You know, as I mentioned, we believe that's what the asteroid belt is all about. It's not about two huge planets that collided and sprayed material all over the place. That's what I learned in fourth grade, and that was wrong. But it's all about getting it together for the first time. So we're going back in time when we go to the asteroid belt and visit these objects and try to piece these little blood splatters together, so to speak. Or is Ceres a Kuiper belt object? You know, I mentioned that was a possibility. And so how are we going to find out about that? There's only one way. And that is to go to a Kuiper belt object, view it, understand it, and compare it with Ceres. And that's what New Horizons is planning to do. We launched New Horizons in uh, 2006. Nine years later, it will fly by Pluto. And a few more years after that, it will go beyond 55 astronomical units, and maybe that's the end of the Kuiper Belt. Maybe it's not. We don't know. But this mission is, uh, is heading out of the solar system. So um, here's one of the first really nice series of images from the LORI instrument that New Horizons took in January. So you can see Pluto, and you can see Charon. This is really great. These are OPNAV images. These are very important because Pluto is very far away, and we really don't know exactly where it's at. Now, when you look at this, the first thing you think of is, well, you don't even have them co-registered. What are you talking about? And in, in reality, they are co-registered. These two bodies are revolving around the center of mass as the Earth-Moon system does, except the center of mass for the Earth-Moon system is deep inside the Earth. The center of mass for these two bodies is outside of Pluto. Truly a binary system, much like binary stars that you can observe when they do a dance. These two bodies are in that dance. Now the other moons that have been found since the time we launched the mission are Nix, Hydra, uh, Kerberos, and Styx. And they're much smaller. They're on the order of 10 or so kilometers in size. And so how do they fit in? And what are they all about? So here they are. Here's really what's happening. Now those orbits look rather irregular. When you look at these guys, see how close they get? Really close. And then they go, wow, look at that. Hydra and Kerberos at one time, was, uh, uh, can, uh, can, we can go back and we can find them very close together. This is the dance these two are doing, and it's affecting the whole system. We've never seen a system like this before. But it means these smaller objects caused us great concern. And this illustrates exactly why. These look like leftover pieces of collisions. OK? They're in chaotic orbits. They get real close. Some of these have collided, perhaps, in the past. Now they're in these positions. Since they're very small, they don't have much gravity. And as part of the accretion process, when things collide, debris goes everywhere. And so the belief was we may be in trouble. Why? Because there might be debris all over the place in this system. All right? And that's kind of tough to take after we go 40 astronomical units. A grain of sand could take this mission out if we hit it, because it's going at 14.7 kilometers per second. So this is really fantastic. We have to be careful about what we do. We have a certain plan. We're right now in the um, uh, OPNAV 3 area, right here in the end of April. Uh, we're, we're starting some downlink. Some data is starting to come back. As Soon as we get it together, we'll get it out. Uh, uh, it's probably going to be the week after next. Here's the closest approach. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, the, the canonical schedule. 
But in reality, we've got, uh, we had a lot more work to do. We had to plan our approaches. It's so far away. It's four and a half hours light travel time there. And of course, that means it's four and a half hours back. We fly through the whole Pluto system from Kerberos on through to the other side of Kerberos's orbit in about a half a day. So by the time we start, and, and, the mater and, the, and, and information would come back to us, by the time we radioed back, we'd almost be through the whole system. So we knew right away we'd have to automate everything. This is the latest color image came down on April 9th. And uh, what's really exciting about it is uh, there's Charon, and here's Pluto, and they're a very different color. So what's that all about? Now, we know that Pluto has an atmosphere. It's very tenuous has a lot of nitrogen. Uh, uh, it may have a variety of other trace gases. And uh, Charon might be very different. So, so the composition of these two bodies will be ex especially important to see when we get there. Here's the trajectory through the system. So here's the New Horizons trajectory. And here is Charon's orbit. So as you can see, we're flying between, as we thread the needle, Pluto and Charon. So we have to do an analysis of there was any debris there. What kind of debris could it be? Well, since this, this body seems to be at some early stage of its evolution, with accretion going on and all kinds of material all over the place, it may actually have a ring. There may be a ring around Pluto. If it does, then this might be the wrong orbit. So we had to plan a couple additional ones. Uh, also along this orbit, uh, we then have to look back and we'll look, uh, the, sun will, the sun's off to your right, and uh, we'll do occultations of Pluto with the sun and then occultations of Charon with the sun. And that'll be important because once again, that backlighting allows us to look for atmospheric composition in addition to the temperature and density. So it's a really exciting time, and as you can see, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, you know, and you add a couple hours here, and man, that's a half a day, and you're through it. We planned a couple alternate trajectories. We call these Shabbats, which means safe haven by other trajectory. As we fly, we're going to take more uh, towards the Pluto system. We're going to take a lot of images. We're go we got to know where these bodies are at. And we're going to be looking for rings. And we're going to be looking for new moons. And we're going to be looking for debris. And we're going to avoid all that. And for us to be able to do that, we had to plan several trajectories. And so these are all really critical late June. We're going to take all the data we've got, and then we've got to make a decision. What trajectory are we taking? And so the information will come in, we'll analyze that, we'll say, okay, this we believe is the safe trajectory, and then we'll make that change. Now when we make those trajectories, these new trajectories, we have to replan everything, because the spacecraft has to do everything in an automated fashion. Now this particular spacecraft is about the size of a grand piano, okay? And of course, the, the instruments are the rest of the symphony. And they are fabulous. They're the most state-of-the-art instruments we've ever launched in the outer part of our solar system. And in fact, uh, if they were all up and running, they'd be running at less than half a 60-watt light bulb in terms of the amount of power they use. Now, this particular simu simulation I'm going to show you is the actual planned nominal trajectory and it'll show you what this spacecraft has to do. The instruments are all on the outside, arrayed around. Here's the radioisotope uh, thermal generator. It's providing it power. Here's our radio dish that sends data back to the Earth. And then up here in the corner, you see the instruments, and then you see the image pieces that they're going to be looking at. Okay? Now we've overplanned is uh, not knowing exactly where these bodies are as we really approach them, you'll see some of the scanning occur well above the body, through the body, and well below the body because the body might not be exactly where we think it is. You know, so we're, we're, we're compensating for that. 
And then you'll see what the spacecraft does to be able to make it through this, all done in an automated fashion. So here it starts out, it's making its initial observations. There it is, that's a plasma roll. That's going to look at the solar wind from all directions. Then it gets back to looking at each of the, each of the satellites. It does the scanning. You can see how it scans things back and forth, back and forth. It goes back to Pluto, scanning the body. Now it does it with the, with the Ralph instrument and Alice. And it's going back to Charon, back to Pluto. Back to Nix. So it's scanning in this region too. That's the region that's uh, going to be important for us, but uh, it'll be too late by then. But we'll, we'll take a good look at what's there. Flies through the system. Now comes the radio occultation. So we're sending radio waves back to the Earth in the inner part of our solar system with the sun in that direction. Does another plasma roll and gets the plasma, the, uh, the whole solar wind environment outside of the Pluto uh, system as we go by and then goes back to the regular scanning. So July 14th at 7.30 in the morning on the East Coast. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So July 14th, 7.30 in the morning, this sequence starts, just exactly as I've shown you. Okay? And um, at the end of that 12 hours, it will still be taking some data. It will radio back. One beacon, I'm through. I made it. Okay? So we're all going to go home and go to bed. <laughs> On the 15th, the radio dish is going to be pointed back to the Earth, and data will start coming back. So we may have some images that we'll release on the 15th. On the 17th, we'll have a press conference, that's a Friday of that week, where we'll have a, a, a number of, of the fabulous images that we anticipate will get back to us, and we'll be talking about the science that we think we see. Um, I know Alan Stern will be, um, will be speculating, he's speculated all along. In fact, one of the really delightful speculations that he's, that he's uh, mentioned most recently is he's going to be looking for liquids on the surface of Pluto. You know, Titan, Titan is the only other body besides the Earth that has liquids on its surface. And there are lakes, actually seas, of li liquid methane and ethane. It's so cold, those gases here on Earth, methane and ethane, are actually in the liquid state. That's true on Pluto, too. He's right. We ought to be looking for liquids that feeds that atmosphere and it goes through a cycle of seasons. We know Pluto has seasons. We might be in for quite the shock when we see this body. But indeed, we're going to be comparing this body with Ceres. We're going to be looking inside a Ceres because we'll be able to orbit it for more than a year, and then we'll be able to make what we believe are some good conclusions between these two and determine if Ceres is really that start of a uh, uh, that proto-planet, or it actually came in from the Kuiper Belt. So that's just in the next couple months. I hope you can wait. I can hardly wait. <laughs> Thank you very much.
The telescope has revolutionized the human experience countless times since its creation some 400 years ago. Celestron is doing our part to continue the evolution of the telescope and expand the horizons of the human mind. For decades, Celestron has been committed to providing individuals with high-quality telescopes and optical instruments at affordable prices. We strive to clear the way for intellectually curious people around the globe to experience and explore deeper into nature and the cosmos. When I think of Celestron, I automatically think of the people. Um, to me, a company is people. We have people that are passionate about what they do, and we have extremely talented individuals that work for this company. And I think it takes those, um, those intangibles to create great product. Founded in 1960 in Los Angeles, California, Celestron has been an industry leader in telescopes for over 50 years. As the world's largest telescope brand, we continue to develop technological innovations that set the pace of the industry. Celestron is synonymous with inspired design and state-of-the-art technologies. As an industry leader, we strive to remain the world's most innovative telescope brand. As a rapidly growing outdoors company, Celestron focuses on products that enhance the exploration of the great outdoors. As a champion of STEM education and the arts, we pursue the advancement of public scientific understanding. Our long-standing track record supporting astronomy, education, and outdoor-related nonprofits across the globe speaks to the values we hold dear. Celestron is committed to encouraging the exploration of our natural world in fun and unique ways. There's like a lifetime of good memories at Celestron. It's probably one of our star parties. I'd say probably at the Badlands when we had in the middle of nowhere a crowd of hundreds of kids coming off of school buses coming up and observing the sun for the very first time through a telescope. I've had so many amazing experiences here at Celestron from helping assist with the setup of equipment with Stephen Hawking to the very humbling experience of a standing ovation after we announced to teachers at the National Science Teacher Convention that we were donating the binoculars to them. One that definitely stands out as a uh as kind of an achievement in my career was when we launched the SIVO telescopes, the Celestron Evolution. That was a really proud moment for me to be able to look at the people that I've essentially had grown up with and spent my career and be sort of at the pinnacle of achievement and being able to sort of unveil that and communicate that to, to all these people that I've, I highly respect and have worked with a, a long time. One of the things that makes a company great is great employees. We just strive to push the envelope to really accommodate the needs of our customers. Those are the keys to what drives Celestron and what makes us successful. Our goal is to inspire a sense of wonder, curiosity, and fun in our communities and throughout our company. We desire to be a vehicle that helps drive humanity's insatiable desire to know the universe. My vision for Celestron would be taking all those qualities, the the company's built upon and taking them into the future, into the next generation. And so we need to be continually evolving as a company. As someone that's been in this industry a long time, I do think that Celestron's best days are now and the even better days lie right ahead of us. We dedicate our work to opening the eyes of the people around the world and enhancing their view of the cosmos into the past and on to the future.